surprised to see so many people so early. Um, this is always an exciting topic for me. We're going to um, kick off by talking about the age tech landscape a little bit. And we know this, right? We know that there's more than more people who are 65 living right now than those who are under five. We know that they're, the aging demographic is shifting and that we're changing our perspectives. But when we look at technology, we need to also look at innovation. So it's not just technology, but also looking at different strategic intents how we're actually disrupting our own industry and creating innovation with an impact. Now, what is age tech and what is innovation? We learned things yesterday in the AI session that was blow were blowing our mind, right? So we look at this. I have this actual original in my home. I think this is an amazing um, magazine. This is in 1924, Radio News. And it's showing telehealth. It's showing a television with a doctor in the home looking at medical monitoring. And the television hadn't been invented for three years, wasn't in the home for another 10. This is telehealth at science fiction level. We have to start thinking differently around what technology can do for us that doesn't exist today. But based on human-centered design, what do we actually need? What's the lifestyle change that we need? So I led global innovation for Genesis Healthcare for years. I helped their initiative in China. Um, but when my first day in uh, Genesis was in Pennsylvania, I came from Silicon Valley to Pennsylvania, and I was sitting behind a horse and buggy. And they hand signaled out the door. And I was thinking, I can't live here. This is not innovative. So I stayed in Silicon Valley, and I sat at the intersection of uh, the age tech startups, advising them on UI and UX and product market fit. And then as well at Aging 2.0, uh, where I was positioned for Genesis, because they were really tired of the vendor-driven model. Sorry, guys, but when you have a product and there's others out there, it's very hard as an operator to take a look at technology objectively and looking at new things in best-of-class way. So we're looking at technologies. I was also helping the senior living organizations vet the new technologies, distributors to understand what's in the landscape, and then also help advise the uh, investors to accelerate this. So my role continued. I now uh, work with Delight by Design, which is a consulting firm that looks at age-inclusive design of products and services and age tech. I am a venture partner with two funds, a small seed stage fund that many of you actually are invested in, and then a large uh, $250 million that we're raising now in age tech capital. But this conversation started over 10 years ago. So this is the innovation center that I designed in China. Smart connected living environment, virtual reality, augmented reality, digital capture of move movement analysis. You walk into the bathroom and the mirror captures your biometric monitoring and tells your health record, your care providers, as well as yourself as an informed consumer what's happening with your health. I designed this 10 years ago. So we should be talking about technology, but others are finally looking at age tech as a category. So I did a keynote address at CES in 2019 on wearables because wearables shouldn't be something that has this cowbell mentality that tells someone else then you walked in the room. It should inform you within your clothing as easy as getting dressed in the morning. And Katie Couric covered tech for good because we're looking at elevating the conversation around age tech. Other industries are looking at it. Business of Fashion said, Sarah, let's talk about the economic impact of age tech. When you look at 70% of the luxury spend is over 55, yet we're targeting millennials or younger generations, and the anti-aging campaigns are terrible. And we know that we are slow to the adoption curve in senior living. We are not having all the chatbots and all the virtualization that we see in other industries like hospitality. But we do know older adults are adopting technology at a faster rate. So how are we looking at our own consumer behavior with technology? Well, in 2020, during the pandemic, think about our own behavior. You're home, you, the pandemic hits, you don't know what you need, so you're researching things. You're searching for information. You then need things delivered to your house because you can't go out. You're feeling isolated, so you need to feel connected. Of the top search engines we were looking at, at search domains, we were looking at Google because we needed information. Facebook because we needed to feel connected. These are just human desires and life experiences that then drive the need for technology, not the other way around. 
Don't just look at tech for tech's sake, but look at our own human behavior. By 2021, TikTok was number one because we needed joy, we needed laughter, we needed to actually be delighted. So who's our consumer now? We meet the needs of our older adults in senior living, but who is moving in next? And what's the technology that they're gonna need? In 10 years, Ironmans for over 60 went from 2,500 applicants to 13,000 last year. People are looking at sports differently. People are looking at extreme living differently and lifelong activity differently. They're also having sex. I mean, look at the STD rates that was in the highest demographic who was 60 and older. They were the first vaccinated and out having a good time. If we're not looking at our actual demographic and the shift and their needs, then we're not meeting the needs in technology. So there's plenty of analysis of around what is age tech and there's physical and cognitive and social influence. And then we bring it down even further. What is you know, helping with ADLs or the activities of daily living and social connection and social commitment? We see these categories. So we're covering age tech before our panel today so that you can see all of the span of age tech. One of the first pilots I ever did was low tech, actually. It was, uh, I'm an occupational therapist, so we did a, a pilot with, with liftware. It was a counterbalancing spoon that augmented the tremor so that people could actually eat better. Well, it's not just about technology and the solution, it's about what the human impact is. So I don't care that there's less spillage so much or less tremor so much. I care that the person had dignity and was honored to be able to go to the dining room and felt greater confidence in their, in their skill. At Aging 2.0, many companies came to us while I was advising to say, what other products are needed in the market? Now, you know the caregiver crisis and you know the caregiver market, but Gillette, for instance, for 100 years, 4,000 razors had been designed for you to shave yourself not one, for you to shave someone else. So Gillette comes in and we advise on how to actually look at the caregiver market. We know there's rapidly evolving technologies, we know there's a demographic shift, and we hear so much about AI, yesterday was incredible, and autonomous things, and, and all of these really technical terms, but what does that mean for us in senior living? Technology is only applicable if you can integrated into someone's human experience. So it's not just smart spaces, but it's how it impacts the environment that the people are, who are with us, how they live and how they interact with their space. Wellness and well-being is now more than ever important for not just the older adult or not just the consumer, but the employee, but the brand itself. If we're looking at paths to purchase, we can search for anything. We can find it, engage with it, purchase it, rate it, your companies have to do the same. You have to have that same digital path to purchase, and that's age tech, because they're coming to your services. People, people want personalization and customization. And there are companies in each of these categories within age tech that are approaching us and impacting us. We can see several in the room how we can have virtual concierge. Many of you heard yesterday during uh, the pandemic this virtual approach or, or digitalization allowed for me to invest in Meztel because we're able to staff remotely positions that we couldn't fill in the US anyway. And now we're looking at filling them remotely in an effective way, both, co both cost effectively, as well as finding good people who are mission driven. Wouldn't happen until we're looking at true virtualization. Smart spaces are not just about individual technologies, but you look at something like Ohm in the center here. This is actually a smart knob that's on a stove that actually alerts if the individual left the stove on. You can shut it off remotely. You can leave the house and say, shoot, did I shut it off? No, I, it, it, it captures that information, alerts you, and you can shut it off. Looking at the human experience of health and wellness and personalization in every brand. Well, we're seeing now in January, the, the White House, for instance, basically said, food is medicine. We need to start looking at nutrition in the home. So at CES, for any of you who came, I know that uh, several of you went, Instacart announced Instacart Health. Partnerships more than ever are looking at technologies and tech platforms as well as the science and research that we know is going to help us with healthy longevity, not just lifespan, but well span. 
taking food as medicine, prescribing it into the home, connecting people to the resources that they need. We need to look at this technology not to keep people in the home longer outside of our communities, but also vibrant living and healthy choices within our senior living. We see the workforce shift, and it's not just one solution. We have a caregiver crisis. It's not just, uh, it's not just one silver bullet, but it's looking at augmenting the workforce. It's looking at robotics that are here today that are helping to eliminate certain tasks and automate certain tasks or create better accessibility of our staff and our employees. We know that care tech is important in order to age in place, but we have to look also at employer benefits. How are we caring for our own employees? Where 43% of adults right now in America is a caregiver. Only 17 to 19% actually consider themselves a caregiver, but they are caring for someone at home. We have to change our benefits and change our mentality of this caring economy. We have to look too at things around brain health. We know we're living decades longer than ever before. How are we preparing for that? Looking at socialization and keeping your brain healthy, sleep, which probably no one got last night, but there's very, you know, there's a lot of things that are finally at the forefront of our conversation. And in age tech, we're seeing technologies approach these in a different way. Mind you, for instance, can capture a subtle change in your cognition and actually impact uh, whether you had a, a slight decline. And that could be from lack of sleep or your own comparative norm or early detection of dementia and Alzheimer's. There are companies now finally looking. So Techstars had accelerators for every type of different startup in the world. But finally, three years ago, we started looking at age tech. We start investing in the technologies to help us live longer and better. Companies like Keep Company that are looking at caregiver support and supporting our caregivers in a different way as an employee benefit. Savly, that's helping with retirement planning because fintech and actual retirement planning is important. Financial health and wellness is important within the age tech conversation. Lotus, for instance, is allowing for environmental accessibility through a wearable and a, as a form of a ring. I really like human-centered design that's beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, not stigmatizing and allowing you to access the things that you need. Lotus does something like that with a wave of a hand. You can access your room, turn on the lights and be able to open the door. But partnerships are more important than ever. And we're seeing that, we're gonna hear that as, as our fireside chat starts now. Um, but partnerships are really important, we see Experts, we are experts in very specific areas, but how we, can we look at innovation differently and expand our reach of our services without partnerships? This one example I'll give you is a pretty powerful one. We know that a lot of care is extending into the home. Well, whether that's in our active adult or independent living, people as they age need more care, need more support. So how are we bringing these resources to them other than through partnerships? So this is Atrium Health, which you may have read about. Um, I know them well, they're, they're wonderful people. You know, really the leader in equitable care, $2 billion of free care a year that they've given to support people. Largest hospital at home program in the country. Pioneer in virtual care, one of the first telehealth ca uh, virtual care platforms. So they're perfect, right? Because they have all of these categories, best of class for telehealth and virtual care. Why would they need anything else? Well, if they want to extend into the home even more, in comes Best Buy. So Best Buy already has logistical support, can ship things, can support things, has technical help and technical support, has brick and mortar, is able to support already an infrastructure, especially around older adults who might need some in-person, some virtual, and brick and mortar as comfort. And so why not combine the two? And this is where really looking at partnerships is so important to extend both reach, get into healthcare from a retail perspective, extend the reach of healthcare from the retail perspective, use each other's strengths to benefit the end consumer. So I, we're going to talk today with a, a few, with Stephanie and uh, with Brian, and, and they have great examples of partnerships, of technologies that they're using that are real. And, you know, we can't predict what's going to happen with age tech. We heard yesterday in a 10-hour plane ride, all the world changed for an expert in AI. And we know that our world is changing forever fast, and so we're looking, I believe, at the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So together, we need to 
to look at what we want and what we need, and what our people need, and be able to look at both partnerships, innovation, and age tech in a different way.